All right, would you give me your first impressions of the National Theatre School? First time you set eyes on it. It was a, a three-story, it was three floors at the top of the old Salada Tea Building at the bottom of St. Lawrence Boulevard. An old ram, a pretty old building. The lift man was a Ukrainian uh, who was one of the most interesting characters in the whole institution. Uh, followed closely by the librarian who was Russian and then the rest of the staff. Uh, we occupied the three floors. It was very frenetic and busy and uh, a bit like a, um, a bee's hive, a beehive actually. Um, I came there quite unexpectedly. I'd been working in England and um, was invited there by a Canadian, Bill Davis, whom I'd worked with in Scotland. So I didn't really know what I was coming to. I, uh, the measure of how much I knew can be, I suppose, taken from the fact that when I got the cable to come to Montreal, I said aloud, where's Montreal? So that was the sort of level of sophistication. Uh, two weeks later, I came over and uh, I was supposed to come to the National Theatre School for a few months of uh, of quiet reflection and uh, absorption, but um, uh, somebody left uh, to take up a job, and so I was immediately plunged into directing Pier Gint and the Master Builder with the students. So we just threw ourselves into it, and uh, it was very fervent and uh, exciting, and all the sort of things that a little bit of disorder will, will usually generate. So it, they were, it was a good first impression. If I'm not mistaken though, you had spent your time mostly as a freelance actor over yeah. in Britain. Uh, how did you exercise authority over a bunch of other students, or how did you f manage to direct them? Had you had a directing experience, or was it basically working mm. with Bill Davis? That it wasn't directing as much as teaching, which is quite different really. Um, I had directed uh, before. I directed a company in Chester, England for a year. I had taught intermittently at a number of places in England. I think it was the immediate realization that uh, this directing, this teaching, was going to be a learning experience for me above all else. So it, uh, there wasn't so much as a, an imparting of knowledge as a, a discovery of knowledge, which I think um, was probably true, is probably true of of most teaching, anyway. How do you describe your curriculum at the time? I understand you would later would talk about the shift to. We'll let this machine pass. We they later would talk about it. You later would mention a shift from, um, in general, a regrettable shift from more experimental theater to quite safe theater. Uh, this was years later in our seventy-two interview. I was wondering if the curriculum was particularly uh, stimulating during the nineteen sixties. Well. Um, Canadian theatre was sort of in its very first stages of development. Uh, so there was what you might call a sort of a vacuum, I guess, here uh, of information, of knowledge, of experience. So we were teaching many young students who had come from parts of Canada where they'd been. I'm sorry, could you take that right. again? Just sorry. the, we were teaching? Yeah. The, actually, the whole chair makes a hell of a lot of noise. Eh? Can, can can we? Can we? You don't think we'll hear that? Keep going. The, uh, there were um, students there from all over Canada, some small towns who had barely seen live theatre or professional theatre. So what we were doing was really, in a sense, virgin territory. We were seeding and growing and developing from um, um, uh, not a simple beginning, but a fresh beginning. Hmm. Uh, name some of the other instructors there at the NTS at the time. Well, Louis Spritzer was in charge of voice and uh, singing. There was um, uh, Jeff Henry, who was a movement teacher. Uh, Bill Davis, who did a directing and improvisational work. Now then, uh, his cousin, um, uh, what was his first name? Another Davis, who taught, us, who do, taught text work, uh, Murray Davis who taught text work. 
um, they were the they were the uh, the centre of the staff, and then there were a lot of um, free, you know people who would come in for projects. Was that a test question? Was that a? Well, it seems basically to jumpstart your mind in a way, too, <laughs> and it also helps uh, out. That's Dane would ask me questions oh. like that. Oh, at my age, no, it's yeah, all right. Well, we're going to edit like crazy. We'll take your best. I don't, I don't mind at all. I'm just joking. A lot of this is good for research. I wonder if you could just give me some of the highs and lows from the National Theatre School period. And oh. was, are there any good stories from the the Blaze and Dundee, for example? Uh, and other Canadians you may have worked with in Britain before? I've shown well, actually, that. it was a nest. Of, there were a nest of Canadians in, uh, in Dundee, which was quite extraordinary. There are people like uh, David Calderisi. Um, to mention but a few um, names will occur to me in a minute but uh, they had come from Lambda which was a drama school in London and the graduates there for some reason seem to concentrate on Dundee it will often happen one person will go there and lead the way and so I found myself in this sort of small small um, uh, focus of Lambda graduates among whom there were quite a few Canadians and Bill Davis came there as a as, an, as a director we became quite good friends. I was the best man at his wedding there. It's not a good recommendation. The marriage didn't last, so I don't recommend myself as a uh, best man. Anyway, uh, he came back to Canada and uh, uh, found himself suddenly promoted to running the National Theatre, which led to my invitation to come here. What was the question again? Um, oh, we'll make it up as we go along. There was the French side as well at the time. Mm. Well, what was your knowledge of the French language? Uh, very primitive. I'd never learned French at school. At Afrikaans was the second language, which is, of course, a Germanic or Dutch-based language. So, And I never studied Latin, so I had absolutely no knowledge of French at all. What were some of the highs and lows of the period? And uh, Well, the French in confrontation was very interesting. There was already a strong nationalist movement prevalent in the province and the end of the school. So one was suddenly plunged into a lot of local politics. Which actually was not unlike South Africa in some respects, the confrontation of Afrikaner and English-speaking populations, the black element, the black issue apart. Uh, there was some something about Quebec that uh, seemed to be very déjà vu, um, in an interesting way. The French theatre scene was really quite developed, as opposed to the English theatre scene in Canada. There really was quite a fervent theatre here. It was very politicised. And, and English theatre was just really discovering itself and often modelling itself upon English repertory patterns. So there was a sort of a colonial ambience to it. Uh, it hadn't yet found its own indigenous roots. That was just beginning, or that would begin, in the early 70s, late, late 60s. But um, So there was a challenge, I suppose, emanating from the Francophone side, which was interesting. Uh, uh, I became quite I became quite good friends with people on the francophone side, uh, which has always been true. There's never been a problem on a personal level. The political issue has erupted from time to time and created interesting moments of togetherness and separateness. But um, but uh, there's never been a problem on the personal level. Excellent. I, we've already spoken to uh, Jean Louis Roux. Do you do you recall him? Was he still with the NTS then? Um, no, Jean-Louis Roux was never permanently attached to the, to the, to the National Theatre School. I don't think he was ever permanently attached. He probably came in as, uh, well, he was much later in, 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 the, in the 70s, he became the executive director of the school. Okay, well, but in my time, no, no, it was Jean Gascon who started the school. Um, and Jim Donville was the, um, the executive director. He's the one who interviewed me in London. He turned up there. I had to go and report to him, and I arrived at his place at about two in the morning, looking much the same as I look now. And we decided that we wouldn't talk. We would talk the next morning. Next morning he was due to go to the airport, so we went and had breakfast together. And he looked at me in a slowly, slightly wizened Chinese way, which is what he looks like in the very early morning. And he uh, said, "I have to ask you something, but I, I'm trying to think what to ask you as a." Good question to approve or disapprove of my of my uh, going to the National Theatre School. So he said, uh, "What do you think of political theatre?" So I said, "Well, I think in in a way all theatre." And he said, "That's fine. That's fine. We'll see you there in two weeks' time." 
So that was my um, official invitation to come to Montreal. But um, coming to Montreal in that time was a marvelous, uh, a marvelous trip because uh, Expo was just about to explode onto Montreal scene in 67, of course, and I arrived in late 66. So in some ways it was, one felt like one had died and gone to heaven because I was plucked from the horrors of a freelance actor's life into the security of um, having a salary, of teaching, um, being in a new city and a new adventure, marvelous people, beautiful people. So you came in the middle of a semester then? Middle yeah, I came uh, just after the semester had begun in 66. And how, how was the World's Fair going to affect the, the student body, the student projects? Were there any highs to come in that first year, end of season? Well, I think it was just, uh, if, you, if you refer back to what I said about the fact that there was uh, so little pre-knowledge on the part of the students of theatre, really, and to have this invasion of world culture all concentrated in Montreal at that moment, and this coincidence was... It was like um, a celebration which lasted eight months. It was very, very exciting, very heady. I mean, the talent from all around the world all came here. And uh, to these kids and uh, to everyone else, it was just an extraordinary uh, encounter. So it, 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 was all, uh, it was all very rich and useful to the training experience and uh, gave us lots of reference points. I remember seeing Olivia actually act at the uh, at at, uh, at Expo. Um, so it was full of moments like that. Uh, what would be the venues in Montreal at the time? Uh, well, Place des Arts had just been created, and uh, um, the Jesu was quite flourishing at that point. It was a little theatre owned by the church, but that was uh, that was very active at that moment as well. And the Théâtre du Nouveau Monde, and so on. There were, there were probably about a half a dozen um, uh, functioning francophone theatres, but uh, virtually no English theatre at all uh, in the city, of uh, no in professional English theatre. There were some touring companies coming through from the States, but they were poorly attended, partly because they were th fairly third-rate companies, which had given Montreal a reputation for being a, a poor English-language theatre city, which I didn't believe. Uh, but um, that was the situation, yes, when I arrived. So it was not a cultural void here at all for the English uh, theatre thing. There was a, what about the uh, ethnic angle? Because uh, when we talk about English Montreal, we're not talking about the English really, are we? We're talking about many different communities. Well, primarily the English, yeah. Uh, there's a big Jewish element here, but uh, the other communities ha hadn't really made their, their themselves strongly felt. Um, uh, the experience of the Maine and the the mixing and the evolution of new communities from St. Lawrence towards other uh, towards other parts of Montreal that evolution had just begun as well. So it was really just I think um, a rather a suddenly aging Anglophone community and uh, a growing Francophone community. Uh, what about the Sadie Bronfman set? Wasn't that happening in there? Uh, uh, partly. It was um, semi-professional. I acted in one or two shows there. A guy called Marion Andre was the artistic director of the Sadie Bronfman Center, and they did two or three shows a year. Um, so there was... But it mainly served the community, the, the Jewish community. It was hardly a, a theater for the city. Yeah, if I could just uh, change the locus for yes. a moment. Um, the Globe Theatre. The Globe Theatre, yes. Yes. Globe Theatre is in Regina. It was at that time mainly a children's theatre, um, run by the Kramers, Sue and Ken Kramer. I can't remember where I met them. Oh, I know where I met them. I was invited to go and do a play, act in a play at the um, university in Regina. And while doing that, I met the Kramers, and we immediately became good friends, we became very, very good friends. And they invited me to come back and teach there. So I went back and did a play, and uh, I remember accompanying the tour up into the northern reaches of Saskatchewan. They were really doing, uh, breaking the sod, 
and doing marvelous work, sending our troops to the in the wilderness. I remember waking up in a place and looked outside, and it had Rose Valley written on it. And there were no roses, and there were certainly no valleys in Saskatchewan. But um, it, it was exciting for them too. And uh, we became, as I say, good friends. Uh, they invited me to go and join them as they were thinking of creating an adult theatre company. And it was a toss-up between that and staying in Montreal and uh, starting the Centaur. I'm glad in retrospect I stayed in Montreal. Any other highs and lows from the touring of that period? Um, was it, it was summer touring? Or yeah. Oh, no, it was winter touring, actually. My. Any, uh, <laughs> what did that mean to you, a winter tour in Canada? Well, it meant finding out what snow looked like. Um, but I didn't go on the whole tour, I just went on a visit to, to see a play open in Rose Valley, wherever Rose Valley is. I hope it's still there. I hope they're still growing roses in the summer. Paddy Campbell. Paddy Campbell? Just throwing some names at you from the Regina period. The Russ Waller, mean anything? Oh, Russ Waller, yes. I think Russ Waller was a, a reviewer and a part-time actor. Doug, um, Douglas Risk. Uh, well, Doug I met elsewhere. He worked in Winnipeg. I don't think he was working in Regina. Um, Doug is just one of the people who, uh, at that time, was starting, was involved in the whole growth of Canadian theatre. One of the early, uh, part of the early movement. Mary Mortar's contribution to Montreal theatre, yeah. what was it? Well, she, she started the Instant Theatre, which was really quite a remarkable little institution. It was in the bowels of Place Ville Marie, a lunch hour theatre. They would do three shows between 12 o'clock and 2 o'clock. People would come there with their sandwiches, usually shoppers who were weary and rest their feet while they'd watch a 50-minute play. It was rather an odd creation. It got very little support from Place Ville Marie itself, strangely which actually led to its demise, but uh, it lasted quite a few years, and Mary was the, the center of it, and she started it. Um, it's rather ironic how things turned out. I, I acted there and directed a play there while I was teaching at the school, and um, are you interested in this particular story? Well, when I was thinking of starting the Centaur, I didn't yet have a name for it, starting a theater, I'd left the National Theater School, wanting to go back into the profession, but as I said, there was very little English theatre in Montreal to employ me. Especially I had this sort of pseudo-British accent, which I still have, which I'm going to get rid of when I go back to South Africa. I'm going to drop it in the ocean just as I, the boat comes into Port Elizabeth. I'll go back to sounding like I should sound. Uh, but, um, uh, so, yeah, and I wanted to, to go back to professional life, and, and I wanted to stay in Montreal. And there was the problem, what would I do? So I thought I would try and have a crack at starting an evening theatre in Montreal, not believing this reputation that Montreal English Theatre had. And I remember going to the people who were the board of directors at that time for instant theatre, uh, Peter Duffield, Herb Auerbach, particularly, these two characters. And Mary Mortar was on tour, I think, of east of Eastern Canada. And they informed me that they were involved in a change at that point. They were looking for someone to take over the instant theater. It was rather an embarrassing thing, because I knew Mary. I said, well, no, I wasn't interested in that. It was not my... But they, they said, well, you know, there was going to be a vacancy willy-nilly, and... Uh, so I said, well, if there was going to be a vacancy, I would be interested in working with them on condition that they helped me start the evening thing. And that was how that bargain was struck, actually. So uh, I inherited Instant Theatre, which lasted, I think, all of another four or five months. And then we put all our energies into starting the evening operation. You didn't, by the way, work with a Sean Mulcahy, did you? Yeah, then? No, I know Sean, but no, I'm not around. Uh, so Mary Mortar's style and influence, did you get a chance to, uh, to learn that, what that was at all? No, I don't think it was, can be defined in any particular way. She was part of a generation of women, actually, who were very creative in the Montreal scene, Francophone and Anglophone, actually. Uh, they seemed to be quite a, a group of them who were 
just uh, creating theatre, um, as best she knew how, or as she was learning. Um, was Martha Allen around at that time? Uh, she started at Montreal Repertory Theatre. No, I never met her. No, that had there had already been a, a sort of a hiatus of about six, eight years between the, from the end of that to the years we're now describing. So although there were people I knew who were involved at that point, people like Griff Brewer, who was the first person I employed when I went into the Instant Theatre, he was working there, and he was the property master and actor, and he is still working at Centaur now, 28 years later. Um, and he was involved in that. So you needed a larger space, I expect, when Instant oh, Theatre was to be found. Oh yeah, we needed a theatre. I was then living in Old Montreal on Rue de l'Hôpital, which was not far from the main, and walking each day past the Stock Exchange, which had gone through various transformations. Jacques Longuiron had uh, tried to take this now closed building and open it as a thing called San Culturel de Vieux Montréal, and uh, he had very ambitious plans for the building including a restaurant and two theatres and a review. Um, uh, and uh, I, remember, I think he was trying to get funding from the province and the feds and trying to play the politics off against one against the other. And somehow they both turned their back on him. I think he didn't play his cards too well or whatever. So it lasted all of two weeks. And it closed down, but they had invested a lot of other people's money in the building and it clo remained closed for about a year. But I was living just across the road from it. I had been in there, had been thrown around by Jacques. So when the I time came to look for a venue, it was the natural place to try and resuscitate. You also inherited a debt there, I think. No, we inherited liens, which I, we didn't have to pay off. I think just sort of fell by the wayside. Uh, we had to buy the building ultimately, but the owners, uh, that was Place Ville-Marie, uh, plus, plus uh, Victoria Saint-Jacques, the people who bought the building and enticed the stock exchange to move to that premise, were left with this white elephant, uh, not knowing quite what to do with it. Was Dr. Auerbach a key player? He wasn't a doctor, he's an, he's an architect, Herb Auerbach. He was certainly a key player. He was the chairman of the board. It was a committee called the Centre of the, the um, Centre Foundation for the Performing Arts that was running the Instant Theatre. So I inherited them. I inherited the board, and ultimately I found myself inheriting that name, which became the name of the new organisation. We advertised on one of the local radio stations for names. It's embarrassing to think about some of the names that were suggested. What were some of the names that were suggested? Did they come to mind? Um, well, there was a building uh, that so across the road that was called, uh, f I think, Fairy Palace or something. And somebody suggested we call it Fairy Palace. I didn't think that was a good name. So we decided on Centaur, which I'm very grateful for. This has led to some nice happy stories the name has. What, do I tell you a story about the name? Well, when René Levesque was Premier of the province, he was talking at McGill. And one of the questions one of the students asked was, uh, did they support English theatre in the province? And he said, ah, yes. He said, of course, we support the Neptune Theatre. So I, when I read this in the newspaper, I wrote him a letter and I said, on behalf of the people of Nova Scotia, I'd like to thank you for your support of the Neptune Theatre. We would also like some support at the Centaur. So he wrote me a very sweet letter saying it, that uh, uh, that um, mythical beasts were easily confused and he wished us well. And uh, in fact, he did support us very well. That's cute. We talked to Leon Major, by the way. I'm sure he'll love that story. Um, uh, they said, that, okay, when you started here, they told me theater was no good. That's a quote we found somewhere. Who, oh. the, who the devil was they? Who was oh, everybody who had any ounce of uh, accumulated inexperience or experience was telling me that English theatre had no future in Montreal. 
and that the centaur was a bad locale, people would never go down to old Montreal because the centre of economic life had already shifted to uh, uptown, Dorchester as was. What happened to Dorchester? Um, and uh, such places. So there were a few relics, of course, of economic activity in old Montreal, but nothing very much west of St. Lawrence. Um, the uh, cafe life was really east of St. Lawrence. So the starting of the Centaur was not only um, a rather adventurous thing to do, but also became the economic center for the revival of that part of old Montreal. And how were subscriptions then from the beginning? Well, there were no subscriptions. We started in our second year, but it immediately took off. We were very lucky. It, uh, things came together very, very quickly. In fact, the idea to start the Centaur, I think, occurred somewhere around July, and we in fact opened it in October. So it all happened with amazing, amazing speed. I got another quote here somewhere. The main stage work really faltered. We overextended ourselves by running two. Years. Well, that was five years later. For the first five years, we only in fact occupied one small part of the building, the part that Jacques Longuron had in fact renovated, which was the. Um, there were two stock exchanges in the building, the Canadian or the International and the Montreal one. The International was the smaller one, and they had renovated that, and we used that for five years. We lived there on a three-month lease. <coughs> and it was only when we bought the building after five years that we uh, expanded to a two-theatre operation and made the classic mistake of overextending which everybody seems to do, no matter how much, how they are aware of what not to do. Was your cast mostly Canadian-born? Uh, no. No, they were mixed, actually. A couple of people, like David Sherman, uh, Dana Ivey was American, Alan Scarf was Canadian. Um, so uh, the, the original group was mixed. Um, most of the, yeah. Probably most came from abroad, from outside, actually, at that point. Which is, again, a difference between the Francophone and the Anglophone. It was still a sort of semi-colonial quality attaching to uh, English theatre in Canada, which ultimately Stratford and the National Theatre School and Manitoba Theatre Centre and the new regional theatres were about to change and to create an indigenous acting talent pool. First, uh, could you please tell me, uh, before I ask you about opening night, to discuss, just name some of the, 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 the players, the company of players in the first uh, few seasons at Centaur Theatre. Well, we had, a, we had a, a nucleus of actors, uh, David Sherman, um, Dave and Dana Ivey, Errol Slew, uh, Alan Scarf. Uh, um, I know I'm forgetting a few people that I should not forget, but uh, those are some of the names. And did, how did you get them? Oh, you offer them work, the way you get actors. Um, were they mostly from the, the school, or you put an ad in the paper? What, how did you put together a company to start with? Or just to draft all of Instant Theatre and turn it into the center? Well, some came from there. Some I met uh, while moving around Toronto and elsewhere. It was just, it was a smallish community. One inevitably knew everybody. Ken James was a name I mustn't forget. He was very active both in Instant Theatre and at the start of Centaur as well. So um, they were happy to come and work for what now looks like a ridiculously small salary. So bless their cotton socks for doing that because they helped us launch. Speaking of launch, can you recreate opening night in uh, October, I believe you said? Is it 1969? Yep. Prime of Miss Jean Brody. And why did we choose that play? Bit odd. Um, Well, uh, we were in the small theatre, as I said. Uh, um, I don't know if it was any particularly distinguished. Uh, we, we opened, we functioned, we lasted. The play ran its course. Uh, 
We did Joe Egg, I think, uh, as the second production. So, in a way, this was, I suppose, represented or reflected the fact that there was not an indigenous Canadian writing pool of work that we could dip into yet, or use yet. So, I was, I suppose, cast back on my experience in Britain and British rep to use those players. They had not been seen in Montreal as well, uh, none of these players plays by Harold Pinter, by Arnold Wesker, John Osborne, Arthur Miller, the American writers, and so on. Uh, it was all virgin territory here. So one could um, easily have pursued that course of simply doing plays from what was then the recent uh, international theatre scene, especially the British. But I was, ang I was anxious to also make a, a fresh imprint and uh, the first play I think we did that represented some substantial change was the, was the Great White Computer, which was inspired by the event at uh, Sir George Williams University, when the students took over the university and attacked the computers on the top floor and emptied the computer cards onto the Maisonneuve. All came down like snow. It was uh, an interesting moment of student pol politics, which we captured in a play and did at Centaur, which I think heralded the fact that we were also interested in in, in doing some indigenous work, uh, original work. I think that's particularly landmark, in fact. Uh, it was yes. Peter Dibera, uh, right? That's right. Wasn't he do, doing the, uh, the news here? Hourglass yep. or he was a journalist, a t TV journalist, that's right. We got him to write this play based on a book that had come out, and it was quite interesting because he wrote a terrible play, and we didn't know what to do with it. And the director was very clever. He turned it on its head. <clears throat> he created a moment in which a group of actors were given a script about an important current event and, and encouraged to present this play, but the play was terrible. So we created a piece of theatre out of just that. I played the role of an artistic director who wanted to do a play about a local event. Alan Scarf played the part of the stage manager who led this revolt within the company that this play was really terrible. And Peter Debro happily went along with all this. And uh, so Act One was, in fact, our attempt to do this rather bad play. Act Two was a compromise. Act Three was, in fact, throwing out the play and through improvisation creating a thematic treatment of racism and frustration and violence and encounter and so on. It was really quite a marvelous event. Uh, the opening night for that was quite memorable because we were invaded by a group of black power advocates who thought that we as an English, as a white theatre, uh, uh, should not be doing a play about um, Sir George Williams' computer riot, which was dominated by students from the Caribbean. So they came along on opening night and wanted to make a protest. They marched into the theatre, but they didn't know when the play began because the director, John Giuliani, created a series of improvisational movements out of which the play commenced. So they were, <laughs> they were left standing there watching the whole of the first play, first half of the play, and by which time they were really quite excited. And then they stepped on the stage and made this speech. But the audience at that time didn't know whether they were part of the play or not. In fact, one journalist who knew they were not got up and said in a loud voice, these people had no right to interfere with this theatrical enjoyment, which was also taken to be part of the play, and he was roundly cheered by everybody. So it all became theatre within theatre. It was quite a nice evening. I'm very glad I asked that. Uh, but also that the whole treatment of the concept, the idea of the computer at the, the, that period was the computer, the machine, is going to take away our privacy, it's government, it's the war. Wasn't there a lot of that, that 1960s radicalism-focused anti-computer? No, it, I don't think it was that sophisticated. I think it was, it was all spurred by a charge of racism against one teacher at the university. <clears throat> and these students from, as I say, from the Caribbean led this charge, and uh, it was part of the 60s sort of protest generation. The actual case of racism, I don't know if it was ever proven, and became irrelevant after a moment. The dynamics of confrontation had set themselves in motion. <laughs> and so it led to this occupation of the top floor. Um, and uh, and to a play, so um, yeah.
How about the state uh, involvement? Canada Council, what did that mean to you uh, in those days? And it meant a lot, actually. Uh, um, Jean Roberts was the theatre officer at the Canada Council, and she was marvellous. In fact, she was instrumental in the starting of the Centaur. She introduced me to Herb Auerbach and to the people at the Instant Theatre, and after two years gave us a grant, our first grant. They were obliged to wait a year to see if we could, in fact, prove our, our ability to last. Um, she was very supportive. They had just been in existence three, four years, and they were beginning to learn the processes of funding and support and development right across Canada. Uh, they were certainly at the, at the center of what we now know to be Canadian culture, certainly. And did they uh, really have a lot to do with the, the burgeoning of regional theater? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Oh yes, without, without them, I doubt if we could have ever found our feet. Okay. And what are the uh, names do you recall from the, support, the most supportive of, of public officials? Oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Um, I mentioned Jean Roberts. Never mind names for a moment. Do you recall the TPQ? Uh, they used to take oh, yes. whatever. They, they used to share space with them, I think. Yeah, yeah they The old theater that burned down, which I understand was actually an old uh, war games room or something like that. Did their theater that? burnt down? Oh, I'd forgotten that. They didn't start off at Centaur, but soon they came along and performed there and then made their home, yes, at Centaur. They were a touring company, went around Quebec. It was very important to Centaur because we became known as an Anglophone institution and the Francophone public reluctant somewhat to come along and see theatre there. So we had to break down that image to some degree. And the TPQ helped us do that. They brought a public there three, four times a year. And um, so that was helpful. We also had to make sure, of course, that our box office and our staff was bilingual. And um, you have also done considerable uh, acting mm. in the early days too, right from the beginning. Well, at the beginning, I was involved in of the seven plays. I probably was involved in five or six as an actor or director. <coughs> Far too much exposure, as they say. But um, I enjoy acting, as I enjoy directing. But I'm not the best in either field, so the combination and the ability to run a company probably suits me best. Um, and but your background was a political, political uh, student. You were a student of political theory. Now, ah, how did that uh, help you? And what did, what did, what baggage did that give you? Here? Well, it gave me, I suppose, a curiosity in political social movements and an interest in the evolving sort of culture of Quebec and, uh, and a desire also, I suppose, to do theatre that was in some way mm, challenging, that had in some way a social content. Not, not, I suppose, to any great degree. I would never say that we were either a radical theatre or an experimental theatre, but I think that the programming that I was leading towards uh, had uh, uh, social content and addressed itself to, I, I, I hope, to an inquiring and uh, in, in curious mind. And the two playwrights, I think, that most typified the work at Centaur was David Fenario, whom we discovered and developed, and who was a, a radical left-wing playwright, grew up in Point St. Charles, and Ethel Fugard, who was an anti-apartheid activist and playwrights from South Africa. And these two playwrights, I think, probably best typified the direction we were going to take. They both arose after the 1970, would you say? Yes. All right. Um, Jean Gascon, can we get back to him for a minute? Yeah. Can you, can you tell me a bit about him uh, and your impressions of the guy? And, uh, well, he you was... Had an easy time back in Montreal after going uh, national? And well, uh, well, that was a few years later, but uh, he was certainly a giant of a man. They, a marvelous, rich personality that imbued everything with his enthusiasm. I mean, he started the National Theatre School, the Théâtre du Nouveau Monde. He was involved in the, in the development of, of, of Stratford. 
So he was really quite a Renaissance character. He had been uh, trained as a doctor, which probably gave him that sort of, uh, that, that wisdom helped, helped him. Um, he directed at Centaur, uh, directed a play at Centaur once. I got to know him very well, he was a good friend. Uh, yes, he became embroiled in the politics of Quebec. Anybody who left to go and work in Anglophone um, Canada came back and had to deal with this issue. Albert Malheur was another person such, uh, Jean-Louis Roux. So, mm, yeah, I saw this, this struggle over the years, but uh, he was very open, a marvelous man. Um, I'm at this point, filling out quite a bit, I find that uh, not wandering into the 1970s is, is quite difficult. Yeah, uh, but but we are successfully doing so. What else? What highlights have I missed? I mean, could I dwell more on Expo '67 in that period at all? What did, what permanent contacts did you make in that year? No, the more the important thing that I made in that year was actually meeting with a new generation of Canadians who were interested in theatre, and who were suddenly to explode onto the scene, with the help of the Canadian government that at that time instituted a number of programs uh, really towards employment of young people. And grants were available for young people to self-employ. And for some reason, the mood of the people or the, at that generation took them towards theatre. A significant st statistic is between 69 and 70 in Toronto, the number of new works went from two to over 100 in 12 month span. So there was a, a veritable explosion of um, new theatre across the country. So I arrived really at the um, watershed of all this movement, which could not have been better. So I got to know all these people, people like uh, Paul Thompson, Martin Kinch, uh, uh, John Palmer, uh, Bill Glasgow, uh, people who were involved in the early movement of theatre, but who were learning as they, as they, as they, as they directed, uh, much as I was actually, cast on to these. I just happened to find myself this marvellous niche called Montreal, which became the envy of everybody else. Um, you said they learn as they direct, but you were directing as you learned, because you were a newcomer to this country. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Toronto, did you go up much? Then? Yes, 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 of course. Tell me about the, what you remember as a, as a spectator or working in Toronto in that explosive yeah. year. Well, I found that work exciting, but I never found the city particularly attractive. I always found it to be stamped very heavily by the, the quality of old money. And uh, uh, they distributed money to the cultural area, but it was always slightly paternalistic. It never excited me very much, the city. <laughs> I'm just reflecting the, the Montreal-Toronto contrary, I suppose, argument which has lasted ever since. But um, it was good to see the, the work being done, but uh, the city itself, as I say, never greatly attracted me. Montreal was by far and large an open city. It was uh, more democratic in as much as people went where the action was. In Toronto, people seem to categorize themselves into um, the type of entertainment they would indulge in. But in Montreal, if there was something interesting, everybody went. It was a city where people went out in the evening as well. Uh, so it had a, uh, it had a greater fluidity uh, to it, uh, a sense of adventure. And Expo was certainly a great catalyst for everybody, French and English. And a melting pot, I guess, for the new for the new communities that were then beginning to arrive and make themselves felt in Montreal. Was there any other Quebec theatre in English at the time, um, in the townships or Laurentians or anything like that that you recall? Or did you tour at all in the early days? We toured the schools. We got a grant, I remember, from the Star newspaper, as was. There were then two daily English newspapers. That sounds like I'm dealing with prehistory, um, going back that far. But they gave us a grant. In fact, I remember the uh, 
the man who ran the, who was the publisher, um, John McConnell, um, yes, invited me up to his office. I, I asked him to give us a contribution. He said, oh, I'd already given some money to Jacques Languiron, and it had gone nowhere. I said, no, 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 this would be your chance to redeem that money. He said, that was an interesting thought. So he invited me to come up to his office to explain my project. And uh, in the course of a day, he made me tell my story about eight times to different people from the newspaper, entertainment section, the financial section, the business section, uh, the, the, the uh, residential section, etc., etc. And each time I told my story, he upped the ante. And I started off with a, one grand, and I ended up with ten grand, a promise of, which was great. And I thought that was a good day's work. But he explained to me at the same time that uh, it wouldn't be coming from his money. There was a foundation. The money would come from the foundation, probably. Well, a week later, I got a letter to say, well, unfortunately, the rest of the committee hadn't been as impressed as he was. So we didn't get the 10 grand. But Peter Duffield, who was on my board of directors, had a sort of a familial connection to the foundation. We ended up getting 40 grand, which was my first lesson in Canadian democracy that you could get to speak to everybody, which was certainly different from England, where it was very difficult to speak to people in positions of power or economy. So you could get to speak to these people, but having family connections was certainly still a great help towards um, grantsmanship. So that was my, my first lesson um, in how to operate and fund and support the Centaur Theatre. Was that 14 or 40? 40. Well, I heard 40. Good. Uh, let's see, what else? What else? What else? I wanted to bring, drag this along till half past. Half past what? Half past? 12.30. That's when we're going to wrap up. It's eight minutes away. So, what else, what else have I missed here? Is it, you're very concise. Uh, has anyone said, told you that? No. Oh, it's, it's a I usually waffle on. Oh. Um, how was your living standard? Where did you live at the time? Or, or no, better yet, who, where did the actors and actresses and directors socialize? Did they socialize together? Uh, what, was the, what was the scene, the bar? Uh, had they torn down Cafe St. Michel yet? I mean, where were you hanging out? Was there a scene? We lived in the theater. There was virtually no social life apart from living in the theater. I remember, my memory tells me. And whoever joined us seemed to live that same sort of very fervent commitment it was totally embracing. We were literally, I remember we had to borrow the chairs from the restaurant across the way to give us enough seats for Saturday night audience and return the seats the next morning. So we were doing everything from cleaning the theater to selling the seats to acting to directing. And everybody was changing hats. Uh, we, were, we were developing and training a staff. Judy Cutler came in as I remember halfway through the first season as our first publicist and stayed with us for 18 years or something or, no, no, what am I talking, 23 years. Uh, my wife uh, helped us start, she was um, part of the first group. Um, we had volunteers who came and helped and stayed. So we were all, f we were busy forming a team and um, trying to understand what made this motor work. And uh, I was trying to find playwrights. I remember going to a number of established writers like Mordechai Rischler. Are you allowed to mention his name in public still? Um, and uh, Irving Layton and Leonard Cohen and all the people who were established writers on the Anglophone scene and asked them if they would write for theater. I remember going to Irving Layton and he said, you know, I wrote a play once, which might be useful to you. He said, I'm going to call Leonard up and see if he has this play. So I remember sitting there and he got on the phone and called New York. And Leonard at that moment happened to arrive, where else from Greece, that very day. And the conversation went something like, Leonard, I've got this young man here who was starting a theater. Do you remember that play that we wrote together? Pause, pause, pause. Um, it wasn't that bad, was it? He put down the phone and he turned to me and said, I'm afraid we just don't know what happened to that play. 
So after a couple of tries like that, I gave up on these established names and uh, decided I really had to go and find people who had no uh, reputation to risk in the theatre, who in fact were prepared to join it as a new activity. And of course, people like David Fenario came out of that, that process. And uh, as you mentioned, Peter Deborah. Now they were reviewing then in those early days, in your first, oh. your first notices. Zelda Heller is a name I've got to credit. She was the reviewer at the Star. Uh, Myron Galloway followed. But Zelda was a great help in those early years. She was both critical and supportive in a way not many critics know how to do. So she was both honest and, uh, and, and tremendous, a great, a great boost. Uh, Nathan Cohen was a national reviewer out of Toronto who was very sardonic, and, uh, but also a great lover of new theatre and a great influence in the formation of the new repertoire in Canada, but rather merciless in his uh, judgment, but useful as a, as a spur. But what's also interesting is that the Francophone, people like Marshall de Silva, who wrote for La Presse, came and we got reviews at that time from the Francophone Theatre, which was also helpful to us. It's a sort of a... Let me ask one more thing. Mm. Rupert Kaplan, did you ever have, have a vacation to work with? Uh, uh, I did a radio play once or twice, I think, with him. But he was already in his autumn years, uh, as, but a great influence in the creation of, of talent. Uh, but mainly in theatre. He had worked mainly in radio, sorry. He had, of course, worked in theatre, but uh, I met him as a, th as a radio man. And Chris Plummer, was he at all coming through the town? The no, he had come and gone. Mm -hmm. No, he had come and gone. Okay. And, um, I think we're going to wrap it up right about now. Have we okay. missed anything particularly glaring from that period? There's so much I'd rather take it on into the 70s and 80s, for goodness sake. But. Well, it just, I guess, the total surprise of coming, of making that trip across the ocean to a country called Canada. I vowed, having left South Africa, I would never find myself in another dominion. So it was quite a, a surprise to come to Montreal, what I thought would be a fairly short spell of time and then to start a theatre for what I thought would be a fairly short span of time and end up living here longer than I've lived anywhere else and to, um, to uh, put down roots here and um, start a theatre company and start a family and uh, start a new life here. So um, those were quite, uh, that was quite, a, um, quite an adventure which I haven't finished with yet. Okay.